So I'm going to start today by giving an overview of Java's structured concurrency mechanism. And you'll see that this is a, a new concurrency model that was added to Java fairly recently. And it's designed to enable the processing of so-called embarrassingly parallel tasks atop the virtual threading mechanisms that have been added to Java 19 and of course beyond. We went over virtual threading in some of the previous videos. So what I'm gonna talk about now leverages virtual threads and then extends and enhances them in some new interesting ways. So structured concurrency was added fairly recently, a year or two ago, to what I like to call very modern Java as a new concurrent programming paradigm. And the purpose behind it is to try to make concurrent programs easier to read, easier to understand, quicker to write, and also hopefully safer. What does safer mean in this context? Safer means that we try to avoid so-called thread leaks and orphan threads. So you can see here in the unstructured traditional way of doing Java threading, thread T2, if spawned by thread T1, could become a quote orphan if thread T1 finishes before thread T2 completes. And that can cause some issues in terms of basically threads running amok and doing things that exceed the scope in which they were created. In contrast, in a structured concurrency model, the lifetime of these two threads are constrained to run within the scope that encloses them. And this is very similar to other forms of structured programming that we'll talk about here momentarily. In particular, Java's structured concurrency paradigm is designed to try to mimic the classic structured programming paradigm. If you're familiar with the history of computing, structured programming has been around for quite a long time at this point. And rather than writing code with with go-tos and labels at the assembly language level. Instead, code was basically decomposed into different types of elements, like if statements, while loops, function calls, and so on, which are more structured. In particular, there's well-defined entry and exit points for the flow of execution through a block of code in an if statement, a while loop, or a function. And there's a strict nesting of the lifetimes of operations in the case of structured programming, things like local variables and so on, that mirrors the syntactic nesting in the code. And the same holds true, of course, for, for structured concurrency as well as other types of structured programming. Structured concurrency is really designed primarily for something called embarrassingly parallel programs. Embarrassingly parallel is kind of a funny name. It's like embarrassing, an embarrassment of riches. It basically means that we have a bunch of tasks with little or usually no dependency on each other. So there's no need for them to communicate or share results between them as they're performing their computations independently. A good example of this would be, say, doing your laundry in a washing machine facility, like a laundromat where you've got many washing machines and you can do lots of loads of laundry in parallel and they don't depend on each other. In the context of what we're covering in this course, the Scalable Microsystems course, the idea of structured concurrency is to enable one piece of code, either a client or perhaps some intermediate microservice, to interact with many other microservices in a cloud computing environment. So here's an example of something we'll probably talk about later. It's a flight listing application where clients, either in a browser or a mobile app, send requests to the to the front end, which is called an API gateway. And that will then turn around and disseminate the request to a bunch of backend microservices to do various computations, to, to look up different rates and different flight legs and so on for different airlines. And so structured concurrency could be useful in such a context because you wanna do these things in parallel. Let's take a quick look at an example. This is an example that will make the starting and ending of concurrent code explicit syntactically. And you can get this example in the EX3 project in my Loom folder in my Live Lessons GitHub repository. Now we're gonna walk this example later live or through recorded video, but I just wanna briefly give you an overview of how it works. So there's this new concept, which is called a structured task scope. And there's a couple of different variants of structured task scope. There's one that shuts down when everything succeeds and everything's done. There's also one that will shut down when the first thing fails. In this particular case, we're gonna do the shutdown on failure model, which will define a scope for splitting one task into a bunch of concurrent subtasks that either all run to completion or will 
finish at the first failure and throw an exception. So this goes into a, what's called a try with resources block, as you can see here. And that just defines a variable called scope that's only visible in that context. What we're then going to do is we're going to iterate through a list of random big fractions. And for each fraction in that list, we're going to start a new virtual thread by using this scope.fork method. And that will go ahead and reduce and multiply each random big fraction concurrently using virtual threads under the hood. What happens when we do this call is the scope method returns a future to each computation result. And we'll talk more about that when we get into the details of this example. And so everything is off and running. And then we're going to call the join method, which is basically a barrier synchronizer that waits for all the threads that we spawn before it to finish, or it waits for the task scope to shut down if an exception is thrown. Let's assume for sake of argument, no exception is thrown. So we wait here at this join point or barrier synchronization point for everything to finish. And then at that point, we call some method that will sort and print the list of futures. And at this point, all those futures will have completed because we would not have gotten through the join statement until they were all done. And then the last thing that happens here is the close method of this scope is called, and it will free up any resources that were allocated in the context of that scope. So that's taking advantage of basically this try with resources block, which we saw back up here. And the shutdown on failure instance that's created there implements something called auto close or auto closable. And at this point, it will go ahead and clean up the resources. So that's a very, very quick example of how you can program with structured concurrency. We'll look at many more examples here shortly. So let's talk about some of the benefits of using this model. There's several things it intentionally is designed to provide in terms of guarantees. One of the guarantees it provides is that when a program's flow of control is split into multiple virtual threads, these virtual threads always complete at the end of a flow. And the flow is defined syntactically, as we could see in the example before. So here you can visualize this as follows. You have some thread that comes in, splits, the flow of control into multiple threads at the beginning of the scope. The subtasks all crank away on behalf of the, the major task, the, the, the incoming task, and they're going to run in different cores and different virtual threads. And then the overall task waits for the subtasks results and also can monitor them to see if anything fails. All the threads must complete by the end of the enclosing scope. So the way to look at this, the thing that makes this structured is the lifetime of a subtask is confined to the syntactic block of its parent's task. Therefore, you don't have problems with orphan threads. They all have to finish together before the scope is left, which makes it structured. So that's the end of the overview of Java's structured concurrency model.